Welcome to an American Homestead, podcasting live from deep within the Ozark Mountains at an elevation of 2,200 feet. It's 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central, and it's good to be back. It's the Late Late Show on the Homestead Network, and uh, we're getting started here. It's 9 o'clock, and uh, got a whole stack of stuff. Busy week this week. Um, got a lot of things to talk about, some really good articles from around the web, the homesteading sphere, and... Um, want to share those with you tonight. Jamie is with me as always. We both have our decaf coffee tonight. So that's exciting. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's so boring. We're so boring. I've got some exciting things to talk about tonight. So it's going to be a fun night. Anyway, so glad you could join us. Um, Folks, if you're interested in these podcasts, you can go to your favorite podcast. browser search for youtube mp3 downloader i know a lot of folks like to uh, download our podcast listen to them in the car or while they work out at the gym or wherever um so if you're into that sort of thing you can go to your favorite browser download mp3 youtube downloader and uh check out our podcast that way um also if you're interested in more great shows just like this you can go to the homesteadnetwork.com check out their show times and see the amazing list of all kinds of other great homestead channels on youtube and check out their, some of their work and see what other homesteads are up to around the internet. Um, I just mean that what? we're boring because when we were young, we used to drink caffeinated coffee on purpose. Not even really because we love the taste of At it. At night, though? I don't remember that. Um, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe that was before I met you. I don't know. I just. But when you when you were up with all your late 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 stuff and going to school in the middle of the night. You, yeah, yeah, that's you true. You used to drink caffeine on purpose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember drinking caffeine on purpose just to have fun with my friends on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. We're boring. Times have changed. Yeah. We have we have two children. And we, so, we like to sleep now. Yeah, sleeping is good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, the big news this week, and I think you probably heard about it. I think I talked to you about it, yeah, was you did. Azure. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you pronounce it? Azure? We were I, talking about that I in just, detail. I just say Azure. Azure. Because, so, you know, it's I Americanize it. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. Really what it comes down to, folks, if you've been living under a rock and you don't know what this is about yet... Um, the, the company Azure, which a lot of people are familiar with because a lot of people order some of their organic produce from them and they ship it. I think it's nationwide cause they're in Oregon and we know people who take their stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have, I don't know how many acres they actually farm, but it must be a large amount because they ship their produce nationwide. It's, it comes down to this folks, uh, the government, the local municipality in their area has said that they have a number of noxious weeds on their property these are weeds that everyone has on everyone's property it's just a it's a weed that's been there forever and they've decided now that they're noxious weed and they have to be eliminated and that they must use roundup monsanto based products non monsanto products uh, to eliminate these weeds which will absolutely hurt their industry because they they focus on growing products you know organically and naturally without pesticides and herbicides and all these things that uh, they're going to force them to use and so basically they're going to force them to use this or um, basically shut the farm down is what it's going to come down to and so this article came out uh, the news hit earlier in the week and I shared it immediately uh, when I saw it and I just went on Facebook before the show and I think our article that we have posted up is over 11, 1,100 shares right now. So it's getting around. It got around the internet, and it seems like everyone is talking about this. Anyone who has to do with homesteading, gardening, natural gardening, anyone and everyone who is into that sort of thing is sharing the story. And I just can't help but feel a little bit sorry for the folks over at this municipal um, government office. Their phones must be ringing off the hook. And and when here's the deal, folks. When you deal with people like this, you have to sort of be a little bit considerate and respectful when you talk to these people um, um, because they are government officials and they, can, they, they have the power to carry out whatever they want to do just out of spite if you tick them off bad enough. Um, now, because it's gotten so much national attention, Um, you know, they may have no choice, but to, you know, to roll over and play dead, but, um, it's just, it's, it's just 
something that you have to deal with with kind of um, velvet gloves when you deal with the government like this. So anyway, I'm sure they've had their hands full. I'm sure their inboxes are overflowing. Their message machines are basically, from what I've heard, are turned off now, I think. So, um, uh, you know, they've had their ear full the last week. And the last time I heard, they're meeting with um, Azure um, on either the 17th or 18th. So the 17th, I think, is going to be, what day is that? Is that Tuesday? That's going to be on Wednesday. Last I heard, they have a meeting scheduled on Wednesday, okay, with Azure. The government does, um, the local municipality government. So I don't know what's going to happen. We'll have to, you know, just wait and see like everybody else. Um, but hopefully they have decided that they're not going to pursue this. If they do, if this government decides to pursue this, um, you know, my personal opinion is I would hope that there'd be some kind of you know, Brady type thing going on again, because, you know, you just cannot let, I mean, a government put you out of business like this. Um, It's basically Monsanto. Monsanto, you know, they're going to use, they're going to force them to use these Monsanto products. What is a noxious weed? Um, Actually, these weeds are not that noxious. I mean, some of these weeds but that they had listed. what does list, that mean? It, it means whatever they want it to mean. That's is the it frustration. an obnoxious weed? I'm just saying, I don't know what that well, means. They mean a noxious weed is something. Well, let's just Google the definition of noxious weed, you know, so we can get it. Noxious weed. Um, it's something, a harmful weed or injurious weed that is a weed that has been designated by an agricultural authority as one that is injurious to agriculture. So... But some of these weeds they had listed were weeds that deer eat. You know, these were these are it's it's, it's food for wildlife. So it's not it's not really that noxious. Um, I, I think I think that was in dispute based on the weed list that they gave, and, and these are weeds that have been there forever on the property. Yeah, you know, they're not growing amongst the food. You know, they're not harming their crops. You know, you pick them out if you have to. So why does why does the government care about weeds? Because the government is owned by Monsanto, bought and paid for. And if Monsanto wants to have something sprayed to take out a, a natural... Because, I mean, the whole thing is about control. you got to have control. And, you know, the whole natural, organic... I mean, Monsanto is a monster. Everyone knows that there's no amount of, of public relations that's ever going to fix that. If they, if Monsanto had any brains, they'd come in here and be like, you know what, back off and, and tell that municipality to back off. You're not going to use our product because right now our product's name is being dragged through the mud. But they don't have they don't have any public relations sense. They don't care that they're a monster. They are a monster. Everyone knows they're a monster, and they're going to do whatever they want to do. Yeah. And it's just the way it is. So um, as I take a sip of my decaf coffee. Um, that's, that's the state of the world we live in right now. So without opening a huge can of worms, I just want to say that you and I have gotten a little bit of pushback because we speak about politics every now and then. Yeah, I I know we're controversial. Yeah, sure. Okay. But this is a perfect example of why we care. Exactly. Exactly. Folks, if, I mean... It's hard to say what what you would do if someone showed up on your property because the reality is here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that they can do this to any one of us. They can do it to you. They can do it to me. They can do it to Azure. They can do it to anybody they want to. I shot off a, a, a letter to Baker Creek when this hit, you know, earlier this week. I said, hey, you ought to make sure you know all your fans know about this because they can do this to you too. Baker Creek has a really big farm. And they have, um, you know, they, they grow everything naturally. Uh, at least they, they try to. And they, this could happen to anyone. So when it happens to any one of us, we ought to stand up in unison and try to get involved and raise a stink and, and, and light the torches and raise the pitchforks because it can happen to any of us if we let it to happen to anyone. So it's about establishing making sure we keep our personal freedoms. Right. Right. And folks, and, and you know, that's the I mean, whole, we're not trying to talk about politics for politics sake, right. because we could care less about that. Yeah. But I, what we care about is personal freedom. Exactly. I moved out here because I want the maximum amount of Liberty that I can get. I know I have way more Liberty out here where I live. I have zero zoning regulations. I have almost zero regulations period where I live. 
Um, there's just a handful, very, very minute amount. And you move anywhere in the city and that just, I mean, you don't have that. And so I like the fact that I had those freedoms and, and the ability to do what I want on the land that I, I live on. But, um, you know, that's just not the, I mean, mo for most people, they, they, they're never going to be able to experience that because that's just not, you know, the state of our world today. And so, yeah, we raise these things up. We talk about them and people get upset and, and they call us, you know, controversial. And so, um, or they call me a hardliner and they don't like my guns, but gosh darn it, folks, the reason we have the ability still to, to have the freedoms we have today is because we have the second amendment. If you can't connect that reality, you have some screws loose. That's just it. We have the ability to own firearms. We're one of the last countries in the world to have the freedoms uh, that we have when it comes to firearms, and it keeps the government at bay. Every other government that has uh, limited their citizens' ability to own firearms, they don't have, they, they have, the citizens have zero control over their property. Zero. It's just, it, it is what it is. But, and you know, because of that, we're controversial. Yeah. Sometimes. It's okay. I don't mind. And so that brings us to our next topic. Uh, well, we didn't really get to some of the other stuff. So, yeah. Um, well, first off, Deep South, um, they were talking about onions and how they have a hard time growing onions too. Yeah. And we really want to grow onions on our property, but we have not, folk, we not been able to do it. However, someone mentioned in the chat room, walking onions. Have you ever tried walking onions? And we have walking onions and they're doing rather well. Okay, so rather well, what does that mean? Every year they get bigger. I mean, the, the walking onions this year were the biggest they've ever been. Like baseball size? No, they're never going to get that big. Ugh. They're just not, they're not that kind of onion. Oh. But they did, they were good. We had a salad this week out of the garden and they were good, right? Yeah, they were fine. Yeah. I mean, they were oniony. They, no, they, <laughs> they tasted good. I think they tasted good. I'm not complaining about their taste. I just want one of those big, glorious <laughs> onions that, you know, I can peel and chop up and throw in the pot and there's, you know, we're, we're a gonna, good size I'm onion. not giving up yet. I'm not giving up. But, you know, Danny over at Deep South, he's had his problems too. And I totally get it. We've had the same issues. And so um, we're, we're working on it. But in the meantime, we do have the Egyptian walking onions. I highly recommend them to people who want to grow onions. They just grow themselves. And Are, are my expectations too high? No, we're going to get them. We're going to do it. We're going to eventually get it. <laughs> Danny made the point. He said, he says, listen, you just got to find an onion that works well in your area. And I've been trying to talk to people and get the onions that work well. And, um, you know, I tried last year on an onion that, um, oh, what's her name? Lady, lady we know in town, um, Susie, recommended, and it didn't work. It just didn't work. They all died. So, um, and I, the year before that, I tried slips purchased at the local store. Um, that people were buying that didn't work. Uh, they just didn't grow to maturity at all. It just didn't. It was not good. But uh, the walking onions, they do work well. Absolutely recommend them. Um, but you know, we're, we're still working on getting actual, you know, the big ball of onions, yeah. you know, red or, or white or otherwise. Um, they mentioned they harvest. They already harvested their potatoes, which signals to me, you know, just how far south they are and how early they started. Our potatoes are looking really good. The plants are looking great. There's no pest pressures yet. I was out there just uh, yesterday and um, there was no potato beetles in sight. There was a couple, there was a little bit of damage on just one or two of the plants, but not much at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're looking really good. So we're going to be harvesting potatoes here pretty soon because I started them a little early and I think we're going to be able to get in a second growth. I mean, we're going to be able to put in a second batch of potatoes. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, so we'll get two, two harvests this year. Um, so what do we do this week now that we got through all that? <laughs> two words. Poison, Poison ivy. Poison ivy. Oh, man. <laughs> so you want to tell them or you want me to? Uh, so I'll go ahead and go. Okay. So I might moan a little bit. Joshua, Joshua, my my oldest, got poison ivy, and um, it was right before we went to Baker Creek. So if you watch that Baker Creek video carefully, you'll notice a part in it where Joshua, my oldest, has his eyes. You can see the redness around his eyes. He got it so bad, folks. I mean, but all that was nothing compared to what it developed into the next day. Oh, it, it, yeah, the next day. I mean, he, he looked, he couldn't he even had, see out of his he eyes. He had slits for eyes. Like you literally could not see the eyes in his head. Yeah. He was like Asian. He turned to Asian. No, no, no. Not even that. You <laughs> couldn't see his eyes. 
It oh, was really bad. It was bad. Really, really bad. And he swelled up like a balloon all over his body. Of course, immediately we started using the the tincture and um, the teas for the j- jewel weed. Um, I was putting the tincture on topically, and I think that was probably a bad thing to do because it, there's alcohol in it, and it dries out the skin. And so he had he had that combined with I think some sunburn on his face too. The sun, yeah, because okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, know this was the worst because he got sunburned on top of his poison ivy breakout. But the reason we're bringing this up is because poison ivy. I mean, I think I, I think the jewel we did really well, don't you think? I think it held it at bay. Yeah, I mean, it was really bad. I mean, this is the kind that you probably take your kid into a hospital. Kind yeah, of bad. you probably would. You know, normal people, but mm-hmm. normal, um, normal people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're a little adventurous, but I mean, it's just, we, we knew we had the tincture and we knew it worked because we've been using this now for a couple of years and it's amazing. He was, but he's a, he was a trooper. Like, I think that had he been younger, yeah, it, it would have, I think, he, yes, I would definitely have taken him to the hospital had he been younger or been our other son. But... The tincture or the tincture and the teas, we went and harvested fresh uh, jewel weed because it's growing down the road. And so we harvested the fresh jewel weed and I brought it up every day, um, usually enough to make two batches of tea. Yeah. And Jamie made the tea and he just kept drinking it. She mixed it with a little bit of seven up. Yeah, that was the only way that he would, he liked it was when I fed it to him cold mixed with seven up. Yeah. That was his, his tea. Yeah. So, and it, it, I really think it worked. He doesn't have, like, you look at people with poison ivy, he doesn't have many blisters. I mean, he's got the raised bumps, but the open sores, he doesn't really have a whole lot of open sores on his body yeah. from that. Yeah. Oh, anyway, so. Um, it think, held it at bay. Yes. But it was tough. It was tough for me, really, because. He was miserable, and you could see his puffed face, and once in a while, you know, you'd see these little tears seep out from his slits of (laughs) eyes, and uh, it took a lot out of me this week. I just really, (sighs) I'm I'm glad he's on the mend. We're doing better. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So it worked great. I highly recommend. We did a video, folks, on jewel weed. Um, Please look it up. It's, it's just an amazing way to get rid of uh, poison ivy and treat poison ivy. It does an excellent job. Um, so check it out on, on YouTube. Um, anyway, uh, we got, went to Baker Creek, had a great video there, and um, I put that online. Got to meet Doug and Stacy, and they were just really great folks. And uh, Jamie got to look at their sun oven. That looks like an amazing product that we're going to have to invest in at some point. Yeah, it's cool. It's definitely better than the one we were using. What yeah, was the name of the hands, brand we were using? Hands down. The Solar Sport. Solar Sport. Don't... I would never recommend buying that if you ever plan on using it for any amount of solar cooking other than just maybe once a year camping. Yeah. Anyway, um, the uh, the solar uh, the sun oven I mean it's it's an investment it's definitely more expensive yeah but I mean it's something I think that's going to last based on the testimony that they gave us there in person um, a lot of things impressed me about it but the thing that impressed me the most was the ease of setup and how she basically folded it up in two seconds <laughs> yeah that's that's a positive so um. It's definitely on the list. When we get one, um, we'll work it out with them. I think we'll go through their affiliate link and eventually get it. They have a way you can save money. I posted that link in the in the video, so you can check that out if you're interested. Um, so the whole YouTube thing, dust up. We got a lot of stuff we're gonna get to. We got to get to tonight. I don't think we're gonna get through all of it, but I want to get through the you know how to farm, how to have a garden when you don't have a garden. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. But the, the YouTube thing, I'm gonna do a video on this tomorrow. So I figured out what we're going to do, and it's going to be this. We're going to continue to post our free videos at YouTube, and we're going to continue to, we're going to, continue to film videos that we think might be controversial because I know, like I said, we're con- we, people think we're controversial on things. Those videos, butchering videos, gun videos, um, videos that have to do with anything about, you know, that could be, con- you know, YouTube might think that even though they don't break the community guidelines, still might need to be age restricted. Um, we'll put all of those videos on Patreon. And um, some of them will be free. Some of them will not be. Um, they're going to be for our patrons. 
So we had a lot of people join Patreon this week. A few people went over there and joined it. That's great. Uh, we're going to put up a dollar a month option. The dollar a month option will get all those extra, you know, controversial type videos. But a lot of our stuff will still remain free. The podcast will all remain free. But regardless, all of our videos will now be posted over at Patreon. Um, I, I have a, I have a, I really, I don't, I'm, I have a bad taste in my mouth because of YouTube. What they're doing to a lot of content creators. Um, they're basically turning into a TV network. They're launching uh, 20 uh, YouTube only shows, I think this next year um, or more. They're, they're basically turning into a TV network and they're, they're pushing out their creators. They're, you know, there's even speculation they may stop paying their creators altogether because they're turning into a network. YouTube used to be about YouTube. YouTube. You. You. Tube. <laughs> and so, but that's going away now, folks. It's going away. And so um, there's other, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. That's, you know, that's an old saying, right? I don't know who came up with that, but I looked it up this week and I forgot who came up with it. But nature abhors a vacuum. And what's being created right now is a vacuum. And a lot of people are going to vid, vid me. A lot of people are going to minds.com. A lot of people are going to steam it. A lot of people are going to just other networks that are out there. We have opened up uh, accounts over at minds.com, vidme, steam it and um, Empire Cred. So we're going to start sharing our content over on those places as well as YouTube and Patreon because I just fear for the future of YouTube and I think it's going away. Um, this just is what it is and, you know, we'll see. I'm just I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket anymore. I'm sharing stuff around and I'm going to start uploading to lots of other places because I just want people to be able to find us. You know, and if YouTube's going to push us out, well, then we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So, you know, that's not going to stop us. People want to know about homesteading. So we're going to tell them about homesteading. Yeah. All right. So the trivia question tonight. And there is a prize. The prize is, again, another folding knife. Scott Hutzler, if you're out there, the winner of last week's knife, your knife is in the mail. You should be getting it this week. Um, but the trivia question tonight, get your Google fingers ready. What is the name? Jamie knows the answer to this. What is the name? What was the name? What was the name of Daniel Boone's rifle? What was the name of <laughs> Daniel Boone's rifle? What was the name? First person who posted it in the chat room gets the knife. Both it's, of my boys know this. Yeah. <laughs> it is a folding knife. It's a credit card. It's shaped like a credit card and it folds into a knife. So it's shaped like a credit card and folds into a knife. First person who gets it, who is, what was the name of Daniel Boone's rifle? Daniel Boone's rifle. Who will win the knife? Who will it be? We're looking at the chat room. Old Bessie, old Henry. No, Tick Licker. Emma Drummond gets it. Yep, Tick Licker. Old, Bet old Betsy was Davy Crockett, right? Um, no. Wasn't Davy Crockett's rifle Betsy? Bet oh, well, she said Bessie. Bessie. But, uh, yeah, it's yeah, so it was tick liquor because it was speculated that he could shoot a tick off of a bear's nose. Emma Drummond, Emma Drummond, um, you need to get a hold of me, send me a message somehow by email or by YouTube. Um, email is better, Zach at anamericanhomestead.com, Zach at anamericanhomestead.com, or just go to our contact page on an American Homestead, send me a message with your address, and I will get this in the mail to you uh, this coming week, later in the week. So um, give me uh, give me, give me, a, give me a shout out so I can get this in the mail to you. But congratulations, you got the right answer. You were first. It's Tick Licker. Tick Licker. You can lick a tick, uh, lick a tick off the back of a whatever at how many yards? I forgot what she said. So that that was that was it. Uh, Simple Life Homestead says so close. I was second. <laughs> okay, all right. So let me go away from the chat room for a second. And um, so last week we talked about the White House garden, the most expensive garden in the world, and the White House garden is twenty eight hundred square feet. Our garden. People were talking about. We wanted to know. I, I, I speculated on what our garden would be. I, I figured it would be more than 2,800 square feet. It is. Our garden is approximately 5,000 square feet. 5,000 square feet. The White House garden is 2,800 square feet. And the White House garden has um, a donation that upkeeps it with the National Forest Service. 
employees who work in it and of $2.5 million provided by the Burpee Seed Company. The Burpee Seed Company. So what would you do if you had, I mean, I would speculate, I mean, how big was Deep South's homestead garden? Off grid with Doug and Stacy, how big was your garden? How big is your garden? I bet it's, you know, comparable to size. I don't know. How many, you know, how big is your garden? How would you like to have $2.5 million to run your garden? I think that, that'd be sweet. Anyway, we talked about it last week, but that was the answer. Our garden is around 5,000 square feet. We, Tim measured it this week, so that, that was the answer. Um, all right, so how to farm or garden when you have no land whatsoever. So the link is in the, in the description below of the video. I provided it. I'm going to go ahead and go over here. This is a really fantastic idea. I found this article today, actually, um, or to this evening. And I was like, this is what I'm going to put the, do, on, do the show on. Because um, if I had the opportunity before we lived off-grid, this is exactly what I would do. Totally. So the, the title of the article, it's over at heirloomsoul.com. I love finding amazing blog websites for homesteaders, you know, homestead bloggers. They have such great information, some of them, and some of them just don't have the, the exposure that a lot of others do. And so when I find a really good article, I want to share it with you guys so you guys can read their blog and maybe find other articles that you'll find interesting as well. So it says, how to farm or garden when you have no land whatsoever. It says, in the city of Chicago, that's how the article starts off. That's scary. It says, nestled in the completely gentrified little neighborhood of Bucktown lives me and my little rental apartment. While it's adorable here and there's tons of trees, my immediate setting isn't any greener than the skinny rectangular patches of earth that line the streets, where thousands of dogs and the occasional AM wolf pack do their business. I'm not sure what that means, but okay, it must be a Chicago thing. Yep, it's totally true. I don't have a garden of my own. In fact, I've never had a garden of my own in the traditional sense of the word. So then wait, how have I learned everything I know about gardening? And how do I post all my pictures of gardens and plants and foods that I harvest if I have no yard or land whatsoever? So I've taken some pretty big leaps throughout my food growing journey. A forest flower in a former life, I started really wanting a vegetable garden, but not having a clue how to start one. So I offered up my free time to volunteer on urban farms in Detroit. Uh, wow, that's scary too. Where I planted seeds and trees for the first time. That evolved into landing a job working on several nonprofit urban farms. Folks, this is how to do it. So when we first, we've told people often that when we first started homesteading, we didn't have a homestead. You know, we were learning, right? I mean, we were, you know, you were doing canning in the kitchen and, you know, um, cooking from scratch. I mean, you started doing all this all this stuff before we, you know, long yeah. before we lived yeah. off grid. Well, I didn't do any of that. I, I didn't do any gardening. I think at the last place we lived before we moved off grid, I had like a, a couple pots out front and I had this little spot that I kind of dug up. Uh, yeah, with a shovel. That, that I, was in the apartment. I tried to grow tomatoes, and it was a disaster because it was right in front of our, our parking area. We would park the car, mm -hmm. and it was on a slant. And so, I mean, everyone knows cars drop oil, right? And so every time it rained, it washed whatever washed off of the car down into the tomato plants. And so the tomato plants just didn't, I mean, they but didn't. that was the only spot that our landlord had agreed that we could yeah. use. It was the only spot I could grow a tomato, <laughs> but... It was so funny. My tomato plants grew really well. They grew tall, but there were no tomatoes on them. Remember, there was no blooms. Yeah. There was no tomatoes on them. Yeah. They looked like amazing tomato plants, but with no blooms or tomatoes. And I think it's because of, you know, the oil and stuff that washed off the car. Well, also, too, because it would snow, and so we would salt the driveway. Yeah, we salted the driveway. So, I mean, who knows what was in that ground? I mean, it was just, it was the only ground I had. It was dirt, right? So I figured I'll plant in it. Well, it didn't work out. You were trying. I was trying, but, but, I mean, I bet I could find somewhere around that town today some kind of community garden I could work at. Yeah. Or, you know, learn from others about. Mm -hmm. You know, because that was the thing. I wanted experience. I had none. And so how to get experience? Well, folks, I think the best way you could do that, and not only that, the biggest thing is learn from others. Learn from people who've been doing this. Find some old person, some elderly person who's been doing this their whole life and pick their brain to death because that's where you're going to get the most knowledge from. And so this is an excellent idea. Folks, I know a lot of you guys, I get the emails. A lot of you guys are in suburbia. You're in, you know, the metropolitan areas. 
Um, you're even some, some of you in the city and you're planning on homesteading. You're planning on preparing for a day when you can make that jump uh, into something different. And I'm telling you, you can do a lot of learning where you're at right now. So um, she basically continues. She posted a bunch of pictures of different gardens she's you know volunteered at, different places. Like some look like they're in front of apartment buildings. Um, the other one like in the middle of the city, I mean, under a bunch of power lines. <laughs> That can't be good, <laughs> but okay, whatever. Um, it says, long story short, I have a lot of experience growing food because I put myself in the way of many opportunities. I chose urban farming and immersed myself in it, and I continue to make new creative food growing opportunities for myself despite not having a garden of my own. This all could not be more true, I swear. So what do you do when 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 all you want to is to grow a garden, but there's nowhere to do it. You get creative. You step out of your comfort zone. You talk to other people. You make new friends. I never said this wouldn't be scary. Take my more articulate, articulate advice, art, articulate advice below. So I guess she's got another article there that you can find um, on that. So um, and she's got some other ways where you can grow a garden, like container gardens, things like that. And she's got a whole list of recommendations and pots and things like that. So you can go through that. But um, the website is heirloomsoul.com. Check it out. Um, she's part of the Homestead Bloggers Network, a contributor, which we also are a part of. And she doesn't like, she has a whole lot of likes on Facebook. So head over to the Heirloom Soul Facebook page and give her a like and uh, let her know you um, appreciated the article. Um, let's see, what else we got here? Um, natural cabbage worm control. Uh, this is a big thing every year for us. So I'm growing less cabbages this year. Um simply because Jamie requested less cabbages this year? I don't remember requesting less cabbages. I thought you said you wanted less cabbages this year. I said I'm not going to make sauerkraut. Well, then we would need less cabbages because we made a lot of sab- ca- sauerkraut that some of it ended on the bottom of the well. You want to tell that story? Not really. <laughs> All right. There are a few, I mean... <laughs> If you've been homesteading long enough, we all have our little failures, right? I mean, (laughs) but some of them are painful, like they hurt you. I mean, not physically. I'm talking more emotionally. They hurt the soul. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. The applesauce was the thing last year. Yeah. When all of my applesauce got moldy. Even though I canned it, following the instructions, everything. And anyway, this year it was all the sauerkraut. I chopped all of that cabbage by hand. I mean, I used my knife, of course, but I didn't have a food processor. I chopped all that. Ca- I got blisters on my fingers from chopping all that cabbage. And it all ended up at the bottom of the well. You tell the rest because it's too painful. Hey, if you're brave enough, you can probably go down there and get that, but I'm not going down there to get it. No, I'm not going down there to get it either. Um, That's a 150-year-old well, and uh, it's all it's got, it's got ro- lined with rocks, and I'm not about to go down there and let it collapse on Well, me. what happened was I packed all the sauerkraut in mason jars, which um, if you've been fermenting, you know you can do. And um, when it was ready to go into colder storage, I mean, you don't have to keep sauerkraut super cold. You just want it to be colder. And I thought, you know, our well is a perfect place because I've put things in um, fish. What do you call them? Fish Fish baskets. baskets. Yeah, like like when you're fishing, you get these fish baskets and you hang over the side of the boat. It's the metal mesh. um, And and that's the way we immerse things in our well to keep them cold. Okay, so, yeah. But... um, The bottom rusted out of the fish basket, and I didn't know it. We hauled it up one day, and the bottom was out. Wow, this is really light. And all the sauerkraut, jars of sauerkraut, is down there in the bottom of the well. Yep, down there. It's painful. Those those things are just painful. It's probably still good to eat, too. Yeah. Hey. Anyway, it hurts so bad. I told Zach, I said, I don't want to make any more sauerkraut this year. I mean, I sound like I'm whining. I'm sorry. I'm really trying not to whine. But it's it, it, it's still emotionally painful. I love sauerkraut, too. I mean, I, I don't eat it enough like I ought to, but I, I love it. And um, so I, I love eating sauerkraut. I love just cabbage in general. I love it when we harvest our cabbage and she would make egg rolls. Those are so good. Yeah, yeah, egg rolls. 
So I've got some growing in the garden. We'll see. Um, but um, not going to be doing a whole lot. this year. I didn't plan a whole lot this year. So we got what we got. Okay. Anyway, so natural cabbage worm control. This article over at the rusticelk.com. The Rustic Elk uh, link in the description below. You can follow along with us. Um, this is something that we deal with every year. We have cabbage worms. We have pests and things like that. A lot of, excuse me, a lot of moths will come and lay their eggs there. And how we have dealt with this before rather successfully is by using neem oil and the Dr. Bronner sal suds. Works great, excellent, and uh, you can tell the difference. I did a video last year on just how much you can tell the difference between cabbages that we did not spray and cabbages that we did spray with the natural organic neem oil and Dr. Bronner sal suds. Worked excellent. Um, they mentioned a couple things here I have not heard of. Um, one of them uh, is tansy oil. I have never heard of tansy oil. Have you ever heard of, of a plant called the tansy? Hmm. Is that a flower? I don't know. Uh, there's a link there, so I guess I can right-click, open a new tab. I've heard tansy as a woman's name. Maybe that's where she got her name. So it's a flower, it looks like. And you can buy seeds over at Amazon.com. 5,000 seeds for six, you know, five, five or six bucks. Tansy oil. So anyway, uh, I've never heard of this. I mean, it's basically like neem oil. Neem oil is a plant-based oil. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it works better or not, but they say this, this woman here says it works really good. So uh, I may have to give that a try at some point or maybe plant some of these. They say you could plant some tansy nearby for a great example of companion planting. Um, she says, just be careful. They spread incredibly easy. So they, they might be, they might take over your garden. Um, it says use floating row covers. I've heard of that. I don't know. I'm not really interested in using row covers. It says get some chickens. Um, wait until your plants are large enough to take a pecking, then send those chickens right out after those worms. The problem is, I think my experience is they will eat those cabbages because our chickens, whenever we have cabbage scraps, we throw it to the chickens and they eat, eat it up. So I'm not sure how good of a, um, of a method that would be. I think they would do a lot of damage. Um, hand pick them off. We've always hand picked them. When I see them, I pick them off. But that's not – there's just too many. And they're, they're constantly becoming more and more. You, don't, you, never, you never find them all. So what's, happened, what's worked for me before is just the neem oil. She also mentions the bad guys. And the number one thing she mentions is um, the bad guys have enemies and lots of them. So you have these moths. You have these worms. You have these, these things. Um, so it says invite those natural enemies into your garden. And she mentions lady beetles, parasitic, parasitic wasp, and yellow jackets, uh, green lacewing also. We see those in our, in our garden. But yellow jackets, particularly, I did a video on this, I think a year or two ago. When you find a yellow jacket nest, you, you can leave it there. Unless it's in a place where someone's going to definitely stumble on it and and it's going to be very painful for that person, whoever it is. I mean, especially if you have children around, leave the yellow jacket nest where it's at. Don't destroy it. We have a number of them that show up, it seems like, in our field every year, and we have to destroy those because we have people who come and camp on our field um, in the fall. And it, it caused one lady one a big problem one year. So... Um, when I find them, usually I will destroy them. But if they're off along the side where they're not a problem, I'll leave them be because they are amazing at guard, taking out garden pest. Same with wasp. Uh, there's videos online where yellow jackets and wasp are, are eating the, the hornworms, the tomato hornworms and things like that. So they're just excellent. They, they love to look for those pests. So I, I leave them alone when I find them. Um, if I can, if I can. So anyway, great article over at the rusticelk.com. Check it out. A link in the description below. And let's move on to the next one. We may get through this before I'm going to move over in five minutes to go to the chat room. Uh, it says, get started cooking with off-grid solar ovens. We just talked about this. And so there's over at the survivalmom.com. She had an article over in 2015. I found it for tonight. And I thought it was a good article. And it mentions the different, um, you know, using the sun for cooking. And so... Interesting article. Go check that out. And but I wanted to mention our article over at our website, the nine ways our homestead cooks off grid, off grid. And so there's lots of ways we, we have the we have we have the solar cooker that we mentioned before. But also, 
you know, our wood stove. We do a lot of canning outdoors, a lot of cooking outdoors. We have an outdoor kitchen now. We're going to be utilizing the summer as the heat gets turned up, and we'll be doing a lot more videos on that out there with Jamie. And so um, that's a big thing. Also, the straw box. You want to talk about the, is it the, what is it called? The, oh, the hay box? The hay box. Talk about the hay box. Well, it's called a hay box because they, um, I think they started using it when fuel was, at a premium, I think it was either, it's been a long time since I read about it. I think it was around the First World War, if I remember right. Okay. Do you remember this? Yeah, but you wrote a whole article about it, didn't you? Mm, no, I never did a whole article about it. Okay. Anyway, the point is that they would use hay in order to insulate a pot inside a wooden box. And so they would stuff hay around a pot that held whatever food they were cooking. They would bring that pot to a full rolling boil, whatever was inside, and then um, stick it in a wooden box, stuff all around it with hay, and it would keep the heat inside the pot to enable the food to keep cooking. So, I mean, it's just, it works either way, like um, either cold or hot. Like you want to insulate to keep the temperature the same as it is. So like what, um, I'm thinking the, the really popular cups out there right now that people are using to keep their beverages hot. Yeah. Like what are those called? Ozark Trail, I forgot, the, the tumblers, whatever. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's the same thing. It's, it's just, you're basically trying to keep what's inside that cup hot. Um, and it stays hot for a really long time. I can't believe those cups work this well, but this is the same concept. So you're using insulation to keep heat inside your pot. We have used this a number of times, by the way. Maybe. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. Um, it's like a pot. What, what's that? What's that? cooker you have that you plug in yeah the slow cooker yeah the crock pot crock pot it's like a it's like a it's like an old-fashioned crock pot yeah that's all it is so um i've used it a lot of times if we're getting ready to go somewhere and i want our food to be hot when we arrive usually i'll do it in the morning i'll bring my pot to boiling stick it inside my cooler stuff all around with old towels or old blankets close the top of my cooler and it's all ready to go we just put stick it in the back of the truck and several hours later when we pull it out our me our meal is hot it's steaming hot steaming hot so anyway that's on our the point of it is that it takes very little fuel right it takes less fuel to bring a pot to boil and then insulate it so that the heat um, stays in your pot it takes a lot less fuel to do that than it and electricity if you're using a crock pot um, than it does to slow cook something all day you always have you always want to have multiple options when it comes to cooking the whole point of the survival mom article that i mentioned is you know what if what if your main source of cooking is taken away from you what are you going to do um, and on a homestead you have the option to have multiple ways of cooking um, when it comes to, you know, either barbecue pits or wood oven, wood stoves or pizza ovens or, you know, propane or um, an outdoor fire pit or a rocket stove or a solar dehydrator or a sun oven, um, you know, those are all options you can use. And you want to have multiple options because it gives you versatility. I mean, based on, you know, the, what you're cooking, it may work better in, in one way than another. So it just gives you options, gives you lots of options. But anyway, check that article out. Um, we'll head over to the chat room. Let's see. And get going on any questions that may be. Let me get over to the chat room and break out the chat thing. Uh, pop out chat. Okay, so folks, here's how this works. Go ahead and post any questions you have in all caps. All caps. And if you're listening to... Within the sound of my voice right now, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button on the video, on the podcast. Really appreciate it. So hit that thumbs up button. Really appreciate that. Makes my day. I can sleep better at night once you've hit that once you've hit that that thumbs up button. So okay. Um, try using a strong magnet to retrieve the jars of sauerkraut from the well. Uh, I don't know if you can get a strong. It's it's like 
20 feet down or 15 feet down. It's, it's an old fashioned well. It's not very deep compared to some wells. Um, but I don't know if I can get a magnet strong enough, it'd be a really big magnet. It had to be a really strong magnet. Those jars are heavy. Yeah, the jar. It, what, what what are they? Quart jars in? They're quartz. Half but gallon. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, I mean, if I can get a big, strong enough magnet to do that, I, I would definitely do it. Um, homemade sterno gel. Is that like? Um, I've never made homemade sterno gel. I've seen sterno gel. Um, we we ha I actually have some, but I don't have. I don't. I've never learned how. I guess it's probably just like napalm, isn't it? I mean, diesel and something. Diesel and styrofoam is that what that is? I don't know. I I have to I have to look that up. I've never looked at make, making my own sterno. With a fishing pole, why do you think the applesauce molded? I don't think the water was hot enough. My guess is that it wasn't a full rolling boil. Um, it was a bigger pot. It was boiling, but it wasn't a full rolling boil. Um. I don't know, though. I mean, the jars still should have sealed. And some of them sealed, but it wasn't a tight seal. Um, and I didn't realize that till later. It was my first year canning. And I think that we all have a learning curve when it comes to this kind of stuff. If I was to ever make applesauce again, I would pressure can it. But really, I don't really even feel the need to to make applesauce. I feel like if I just canned the apples, yeah. I, I, applesauce is so much more work. And to me, it's not really worth the work. If something is worth the work, I'm going to do it. But to me, you, you should just can the apples <laughs> without making them into applesauce first. That's just my own feeling on it. Uh, Simple Life wants to know how our land is healing after all that rain. Um, doing pretty good. I mean, it's good to get the rain. We're on a mountaintop, so it all rolls downhill. We don't get a lot of flooding up here. Um, it doesn't stay long. Um, we have a lot of water anyway up here, so um, it's, it's it hasn't been bad. It's it's been fine. Our 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 garden needed a little bit of help afterwards, but it 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 fixed right up. So it was good. Um, we're gonna, we'll do some videos in the garden this week, and I'm going to do a video on the well tomorrow, actually. It, it, it was my plan to do a video on the well tomorrow. We'll talk about that a little bit because um, I want to show you our other well. We've, we, have three, we have three wells on the property. One we drilled, two that existed back in the 1800s. Um, that we've, I've only shown one of those. I'm, I'm going to take you guys down, and I'll videotape the second one and show you about that. Let's see. What else? Um... What type of pest do I hate most in the Ozarks? Is that what it said? I, I, it scrolled up. So, what type of pest do you hate most in the Ozarks? Are roaches a problem? Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of roaches. We do see them every once in a while, but they haven't really become a problem. Um, we see. We've had a few more this year. They've come in when it rains. Yeah, the the yeah we get some of those. We get we get ants every once in a while too. Um, that come in, but it hasn't been a big problem. Folks, I really think that our chickens are the greatest barrier for insects coming in our house. Um, I really think I have seen more in insects when I lived in the city in my house than I do in the country because... Except flies. Except flies, because they can, they can, they don't, the chickens <laughs> can't get to them. But um, I'm telling you, when your chickens are free-ranging around your house... They are on constant patrol. They're eating anything they find um, and gobbling them up. And so, it, you know, I know that chicken poop, walking through chicken poop, sometimes, you know, you take your shoes off before you, when you come in the door. That's all. It's simple. Take your shoes off. But they're a big barrier. What? She looks, she's looking at me like, you never take your shoes off. <laughs> well, I do. I check. I just check my boots before I walk in the door. If there's any chicken poop on, I take them off, or I, I just have have her go get what I need. You guys, I'm really. I don't. I don't even mind saying it. I'm really anal about my floor. <laughs> I really am. Like I, I. I just am. I can't. Oh, I'm really trying hard to to let it go and not worry about it. But I just am. <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah, so um, we, uh, 
I think I think our I think our house is bug free simply because we let our chickens roam around the outside of our house, um, for the most part. We've had really good luck with that, and the, the woods are I mean the woods are just off our back porch, so but they they run around right there and they eat everything. So um, if, again, folks, if I don't get to your question, please repost your question in all caps. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, do you spray the whole garden with neem oil or just some plants? You get, or do some plants get burned by it? No, neem oil will not burn any, any of your plants. I have never seen that. Um, it's not. It's not a fertilizer. It's. It's just a. It's just a plant that bugs don't like. So I pl- I spray my cabbages with it and my potatoes with it. It keeps the potato beetles away. It does fantastic with your potatoes and it does fantastic with your with your um, cabbages. But I haven't really used it for anything else. I don't really need it for anything else other than that. Um, I don't have a whole big issue with aphids, you know, on my tomatoes, so it, do, it doesn't really bother it. So I'm not worried about it. Um, yes, Jan Partain says, I'm making guineas my first purchase. Absolutely. If, you know, Jan says, Jan just bought 10 acres, and I saw that in the chat room. Congratulations on your new land purchase. If you have ticks and you have chickers, guineas are it. In fact, if you're interested... Um, send me an email. I'll forward it on to Tim. We may have some guineas since I know you're in the area. Um, we may, if you want to buy some of our guineas, we may be able to sell you a few. We just sold some to our neighbor uh, down the road a little, uh, a few days ago or a few weeks ago, and I'm not sure if Tim wants to sell anymore. But if you're interested, we might be able to uh, sell you a few. I'll ask Tim and, and see if we'll see what he says. Um, but other than that, you can find them on Craigslist and in town in Huntsville. They sell them. You can find different people who have them. So, But get guineas, man. They take out the ticks for sure. Ticks. Um, how do you keep the chickens from scratching your garden and flower beds? They don't get in my garden. I have, I have a fence around my garden. You know, so I don't, get, I don't put the chicken. When, when things start growing in my garden in, in the early spring, you know, they, they're out of the garden. But other than that, I let the chickens go in there anytime they want except for when things are growing in it. Chickens stay out of my garden. Um, let's see. Fire ants are the plague in Texas. Yeah, I heard that same way in Georgia and other places too. I think uh, Deep South Homestead has problems with fire ants. I, I, think, I, I think I remember him saying that. Um, do I, I need a chicken in my house for the spiders. Folks, if you put chickens around your house, you the spiders will never get in your house. I'm telling you. I mean, you got to deal with the chicken poop for sure, but... You won't have any bugs, or you'll have a lot less bugs. Less. Yeah. I wouldn't say We any. still have bugs, yeah. We but, have bugs. I mean, you remember all the bugs we used to have in the cities? We lived in St. Louis? I mean, remember those Remember those things that ran across the floor with like a bazillion legs on them? Bazillion legs? Remember those? Like a centipede kind Yeah, they're of like thing? a centipede thing. I forgot what they're called, but um, they were always everywhere, like in, in the county and the city in St. Louis. They were in the basements. Um... They say they're really beneficial. They eat a lot of other insects. Like a silverfish? No, not well. Silverfish is one, yeah, but they also had those other centipede-looking things. Uh, I forgot. I saw an article yeah. on on Facebook of, of those things not, not that long ago, and it said never kill them because they're beneficial insects. I found a spider in my coffee the other morning. Yeah, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I just poured my coffee in my cup. I didn't even look to see what was in the cup first. And a spider had made a web in my cup overnight. Peoria dude says, breed more guineas and sell them. The problem with guineas is you can't get them to lay in captivity. It's really hard that, for that to happen. Um, you have to find their nest. You have to watch them, find their nest, take their eggs, and um, then put them underneath of chickens and let the chickens hatch them out. But... It's really hard to get guineas to raise their to raise their own chicks successfully. Most of them will just kill their they're 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 horrible parents. Just just horrible. Horrible parents. Um let's see. How do you keep guineas at home? is that guineas or guineas? I don't I'm I think she's saying sure. guineas. Guineas at home. Uh, oh, how do you keep them from wandering? Oh, you gotta lock them up for like three weeks at least. Yeah, keep them locked up in a coop for like three weeks and then let them out and they'll stick around. And then every night before, you know, you put them back in the coop or whatever, give them some more feed, you know, that give them a little bit of feed. But um, they'll stick around for that. We, we, we have guineas and, and we've, we've lost guineas too. Some of them have gone to join other flocks in, in the area. 
Um, some of them just run away um, and they become food for coyotes or whatever, but or hawks or whatever. My dad calls them an expendable commodity. They are an expendable commodity. That's exactly right. Because the, the value they provide is priceless. Yeah. It's priceless. Yeah. <clears throat> but you're going to lose them. So you got to keep buying them or raise your own. And we've, we've, we have learned to raise our own by finding out where their nests are, taking their eggs, and putting them under chickens when a chicken goes broody. And lo and behold, we get guineas every year, new guineas. So... We had so many this year, we had to sell some. Uh, let's see. Spiders reduce the acid in coffee. Oh. <laughs> that can't be true. I think that's directed at teasing me. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's see. Uh, turn your cups upside down on the counter. That's what we should do. Yeah. That's what we should have done. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> It's been an interesting week, folks. Jamie's tired. I think There's we're... always something. And I I mean, it's just life. There's always something. <laughs> <laughs> if it if that's the worst is to get a spider in your coffee, but I'm not a morning person. I, I don't I don't pay attention to those things in the morning. I just want my coffee. <laughs> when are you gonna do a video on your first aid preps? That's a perfect example of a video where we're probably going to post over at Patreon and leave it demonetized on YouTube. And the reason I say that is because, you know, have you guys ever seen the uh, YouTube channel Patriot Nurse? Patriot Nurse. Um, she is one of these people who have had most, a lot of her videos demonetized. And, and so she's looking, you know, she even moved her channel over at uh, Full 30, which I wish we could move our channel over there. But uh, they, it's invitation only. Anyway, um, they uh, that 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 kind of stuff gets demonetized and flagged. So um, because you start talking about medical stuff and you're not a doctor, oh, you were asking for a whole bunch of hurting. And they don't they don't want that kind of stuff on YouTube because you know they have all kinds of problems with it. So um, we will do videos on first aid preps. We haven't done it before because I was kind of worried about you know that, those kind of issues. But I think we're going to start doing them, and we'll put it over at um, uh, Patreon. So we'll post it on Patreon. Or, you know, it'll, we'll post it on things like Minds.com and other places. We're going to start mirroring all of our stuff over at those other places, too. So <laughs> What? Yeah. Oh, it's better than a slug in your salad. <laughs> Good job, good. You guys, it's just bug season. Like I, I, I always have to just tell myself this Think. every year. Psych up myself. Okay, you know what? Get ready for the bugs because, yeah, we do our best to try to deal with them. But the reality is, it's bug season. Arnie's thinking positive though. He's just trying to think positive. <laughs> good job there, Arnie. Thinking positive. <laughs> yeah, but still, like, the the thing is the flies. That's my thing. Yeah, the flies are just the bane of our existence. It comes to a certain point when you just want them all to just die and, and lock yourself in a in an airtight room, you know, because the bugs, are, the flies get so bad. But, you know, we have chickens. Again, we have chicken poop. You know, we, it, it's, it's just, there's a trade-off, you know. I have chickens. They're running around our yard. They're eating all the bugs that get in the house, but they're pooping on the ground, which creates more flies, and we have flies all, everywhere. So we're going to try to find some fly traps. I saw that m- amazing fly trap we mentioned a couple shows back. I'm going to try to order that this year, and we're going to see just how excellent it does. And by the way, it collects all these flies with, using no chemicals, and you can turn those flies into chicken food later. So yeah. the chickens will ultimately get the flies anyway. Yeah. I think that's just... That's poetic justice. That's just amazing. That's just amazing. So, hey, folks, had a great time hanging out with you again tonight and uh, it's about 10 o'clock it's the end of the late late show here on um the homestead network um last question when were you going to start milking your cow we still have another year or so before we can get her pregnant she's still a young cow so i figure maybe in another six months uh we take her into the vet we get her pregnant there and then after that we have another basically a whole it's a whole year before we can get milk She's still young. It's a young milk cow. She's doing great. We'll do a video on her coming up soon, probably, since you're interested. But, um, all right, folks. See you next time on the Homestead. <laughs>